Well, welcome everyone to CG's seminar stroke webinar number 362. And we're going to talk about the regional factor in the governance of higher education in what has been the highly centralized higher education system of England. And to lead us through that discussion, we have a great team of Michael Shaddock and Aniko Horvath, who are the authors of us now a growing number of books on this theme. Uh, and they're bringing out their, their masterpiece on the regional factor in higher and tertiary education in the UK this year. They've already brought it out, they've already launched it, and it's now beginning to circulate. They're going to talk to us about that study. Before I introduce them fully, let me take you through the webinar protocols. Now, remember that the webinar is recorded, and um, uh, what you say will be on YouTube, accessible through our YouTube channel, and also directly through our CG website. We expect that this webinar will be posted next Monday or Tuesday when our communications officer, Mary, um, returns to duties. She's currently on leave. Thanks to Fana Harley, who is helping out with communications this week. Um, during the webinar, we advise you to keep muted. Uh, it's a good idea to keep your camera off as well, less distracting for us all, but. We, of course, want you to put on your mic and your camera when, and when you come into the Q&A discussion in the second half of the webinar. We advise you to use speaker view in the top right-hand corner there, which enables you to see who's speaking at any given moment in the webinar. Now, to join the discussion at the end of the presentations by Mike and Aniko, to join the discussion, use the chat. Put your question for the presenters or your statement that you'd like to make in response to the themes of the webinar in the chat, and then I'll be able to select you in to, to the conversation. Do come in fairly early because we found on Tuesday again, as we often do, people coming forward with good questions in the last 10 minutes were missing a miss out because we often have a full list of speakers by then. Now, when I'll send you a, a note in the chat, a kind of private note to say that we want to bring you onto camera um, after you've made your comment in the chat. Uh, and, and then when you are called in to come in into the Q&A, um, do turn on your mic, turn on your camera if you can, and then tell us who you are and where you are from and then make your question or your statement. So to our presenters, well, I think Mike is going to lead off and give the main presentation and then Aniko will be joining the discussion with him. Um, Mike is a visiting professor at UCL Institute of Education and an honorary research fellow in the Department of Education at Oxford. He has a stellar career in the UK as a university leader, as an innovative thinker about institutional development, the Warwick model, uh, which he designed, I think, more than anyone else, collective effort, no, of course, um, has had tremendous impact as a model of the, of the contemporary university and its development in relation to its environment and to its internal workings um, imitated all over the world or influential all over the world is probably a, a more precise term. Um, Mike became, after he left Warwick, um, he became a uh, professor at UCL and led the development of um, the higher education management program uh, at master's level there. Uh, that program has been perhaps the leading program in the UK. He's, uh, he's been a, a major scholar, um, as originally trained as an historian, He's had a, a succession of important books on, U, on UK, particularly English higher education over the years. And we've been fortunate that in recent years, since 2015, he's been working within the Centre for Global Higher Education program, uh, leading the project on governance in higher education, which has got a UK focus, but also a European comparative focus and, and also has dabbled, I think, a bit further in comparison as well. Um, Mike's work on, on governance and on higher education history and, and management has been closely watched all over the world for a long time. We're pleased to have him with us today. And Nico Horvath, uh, I know well, um, was actually on the appointments committee when she came into her role as a research associate at a, uh, UCL uh, on the Center for Global Higher Education Program on Governance. She subsequently worked with Mike now since 2016 and um, has, um, has co-authored uh, his studies of governance with him 
uh, and has, has also been involved with him in the gathering of the data. Um, so we're very fortunate to have both scholars with us and we look forward to the presentation. At this point, it's a delight to hand over to Mike Shadock. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Simon, for a very nice, if rather too kind introduction. Uh, let, let, me, let me talk uh, us through the overview first. So if we go to the overview. Um, <clears throat> if you look across Europe, significant variations in higher education, management and control occur all over the place. It's smaller countries like Norway, Portugal or Ireland, they have largely centralized systems. In larger countries like Germany, France or Italy, they have higher education systems which are partly, or in the case of Germany, wholly decentralized to regions. England, which has the largest university system, 134 universities at the last count, remains centralized. The question we ask is why and should it change? And you'll see as the last point in the overview, we've added a kind of addendum. Where is the likely resistance to ideas about structural change likely to come from? Next slide, please. We want to talk now about the project that we, we started on. Um, and the interesting thing about the project and about this presentation is that when we started the research project, we didn't anticipate where we are now. Our motive or our objective in starting the project was to look at the impact of geophysical environment, the, the geophysical environment on individual universities, and to do that rather than think about what the impact of universities themselves might be on the environment. In other words, we turned around a kind of conventional view of universities undertaking various forms of regional engagement. And <clears throat> If you notice, uh, universities, uh, when making presentations about regional engagement, are not necessarily uh, too impartial in the way they do it. In other words, they tell you all the good things, but they don't tell you anything about what the region really thinks about it all. Um, we built for the project, on a previous book that we did, indeed our first book in the governance series, on the governance of British higher education, the impact of governmental, financial and market pressures. And that has given us a special interest in this study because within that book and within that research project, we did a, sp a special study of the results of decentralization to Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. And those studies have been very influential in our thinking about how this original project might have developed. What we did was we selected 12 universities two from the Russell Group, two other pre-92 universities, four post-92 universities, in other words, former polytechnics, four post-92 post universities, in other words, universities founded after the, the wave of the polytechnics upgrading. Nine of these universities were in England, two were in Scotland and one was in Wales. And we also interviewed uh, policymakers in England, in Wales and in Scotland. 
the what we're going to talk about now is a product of the book and the product of what I suppose in a classic research sense is a situation where we started with one set of ideas and then the research findings moved us in another direction. And this was in the direction of a strongly regional system. Next slide, please. One of the interesting things for us has been that the research has taken us into much wider issues of governance within the UK. Governance of, of the public, not just of higher education. There's a consensus among economists and economic geographers that Britain is over-centralized. Professor McCann from Manchester in a study in, in, an, in an article in the journal Regional Studies published in, 1919, in 2019 says that the UK is the most centralized country in governance terms in Europe. And a white paper issued by the, gov by the government leveling up seems to confirm this, though <clears throat> it, it's not clear how strongly that is now felt, bearing in mind the many changes of government that have taken place since. But the principle of decentralization does seem to be accepted in Whitehall. And both major political parties have, at least formally, uh, said that this is a policy which they're anxious to explore further. At the moment, we have 318 local authorities. In other words, uh, these statutory bodies are those to whom government can legitimately look to for uh, regional and economic development. And clearly this is unsatisfactory. Uh, so the, what the government is doing is encouraging the creation of combined authorities and the election of Metro mayors. Now, when I say encourage, the government has adopted the strategy of allowing these com combinations to take place voluntarily. So at the moment, there are only 12, but it certainly looks as if there will be very many more in the relatively near future. And of course, we have to remember that there are precedents in this de decentralization because we have devolution to Wales, to Scotland, and to Northern Ireland. Within that, higher education decentralization started in 1992. And of course, these countries uh, received dev overall devolved uh, governance uh, from 1998. Um, and for those who are not familiar with, with, with the devolved structure, each of those countries has a, a parliament, uh, an assembly, uh, and has first ministers. And they have complete control over their higher education systems. But it's important to remember that they actually contain only 15% of the UK population. So 85% of the population of the UK is actually uh, governed in, a in an entirely centralized uh, manner. Next slide, please.
Where does higher education stand now? Well, the record shows a continuing process of centralization of policymaking towards higher education over the last hundred years. Historically, apart from Oxbridge and seven 1960s new universities, universities have all been founded by their local communities. The title, the civic university, tends to emphasize the fact that the Manchesters, the Leeds, the Birminghams, the Liverpools created the universities and created them partly uh, to be uh, uh, parallel to Oxford and Cambridge. Um, <clears throat> so what you will see is that the tradition of the UK system is that universities get founded from the community rather than that they're founded uh, by government itself. And there have been a series of stages where this situation has become centralized. The first stage is the formation of the University Grants Committee. Now that, that came about because the universities in the period after the First World War came together to ask for funding uh, from the government. The universities themselves had lacked investment over the period of the war and were also facing a huge expansion of student numbers from mobilized members of the armed forces. But the creation of the University Grants Committee introduced for the first time a centralizing element in the control of the university system. At that stage, the government was only uh, funding about one third of a university's income. But that was to change in 1946 when the government essentially, and at the request of the universities, let me say, took over the financing of the university system. And from that point onwards, uh, there was a uh, 80% of government funding made up as a university set, set of accounts. But the important thing was that this intermediary body, the University Grants Committee, stayed in place. So the payment of grants, the disposition of the grant, the choice of uh, who got what was not in the hands of the government but in the hands of a broadly speaking academic body, the UGC. The second stage is in 1992. In 1967, uh, the government uh, created a set of 30 polytechnics, but these polytechnics were under the care of individual local authorities. And at the same time, uh, in 1992, uh, the, let me go back a little. In 1992, the government abolished the local authority interest in the polytechnics. And it also abolished uh, the local authorities control over further education colleges. So that in one giant step, a university system uh, of 45 or so universities was doubled, uh, all controlled centrally through a higher education funding council. My third stage is the reformation of institutional governance within universities, the marketized so-called business model. And here, what has happened is that 
government has encouraged universities to move from having a broadly representative governing body to a governing body that looks essentially like a private sector board. And this, of course, has had a distinct effect on how universities themselves are managed. But more important from the point of view of this presentation, it's, it's removed a local interest largely from governing bodies. So what you have now is a governing body structure which points strongly towards the center and is strongly influenced by central government. Whereas previously, governing bodies had a spread of lay members, often entirely representative of different uh, local communities. <clears throat> and my fourth stage is the creation or, or the, the abolition of the Higher Education Funding Council, the abolition of the intermediary body, and the creation of an office of a regulator, the Office for Students, which has allowed uh, the government to be much more interventionist than it ever was uh, in previous years. Now, the essential point of this uh, short historical introduction is that the relationship with local com communities has been severely weakened. Incrementally, policies have been implemented which have wholly centralized the governance of the university system. Next slide, please. I'd like now to turn to the further education sector. And it's important to realize that the further education sector comprises about 240 colleges but a large number of these are also in, engaged in higher education. And further education represents a critical component of post-secondary education. We did a study uh, in which uh, <coughs> a colleague, Steve Hunt, was closely involved, looking at the FE further education HE higher education interface. We sent out a substantial questionnaire and we got a 45% return. This was a questionnaire sent to all colleges within the UK. What came out of the replies was that 89% of these colleges had formal programs of one sort or another with universities. So we looked at progression, franchising, validation, or apprenticeship progress, progression agreements. And 95 universities, more than half of the UK universities were signed up to these kinds of formal arrangements. In other words, what you now have are two systems running side by side, overlapping and complementary. But in practice, what you also find is that these two systems are run quite separately and in centralized ways from the government. The universities are, as it were, run by the Office for Students. 
The FE sector is run and funded by the education or, or skills and skills funding agency. Both, both of these agencies fall under the Department for Education, but they don't talk to one another. And they certainly don't talk to one another about the detailed arrangements between one institution in one sector and one institution in another sector. We've got in our book, which I didn't mention earlier, but let, let me mention now, the product of our research has been published and Simon mentioned it uh, in the book, Universities and Regions, uh, the impact of locality and region on universities, governance and, and strategies. And that was published in May. But what we found was that there were all sorts of close relationships between FE colleges and universities, which simply were not uh, picked up in descriptions of sectors. Let me give you one example. The University of Plymouth. Plymouth is in the southwest uh, of the country. It's a largely economically deprived area. It has partnerships with 12 FE colleges, colleges are located from Penzance in the far west to Bridgewater towards the center of the country. Plymouth takes over 60% of its students from that area. And over 60% of its graduates return to their communities. 3,000 students in FE colleges are working towards qualifications which the University of Plymouth will award. Also, what we found what was that the FE colleges had a far greater reach into the community than universities generally had. Of the 318 local authorities, 260 have at least one of 20% of the most deprived areas in the country within their boundaries. FE, in other words, is the front line of the post-secondary system in stimulating entry into HE from deprived communities. And one of the things that you'll find in, in the book, if you ever get around to reading it, is examples of where FE has moved into impoverished areas and brought people through the system into higher education. What it was clear from our study was that there's no longer a clear administrative separation between HE and FE. They overlap and they complement one another. If we're serious about leveling up, widening education opportunities, there needs to be a realignment to unify the HE and FE structure into a tertiary structure, in which the driver is not a student-driven market, but the importance of opening up opportunities for further and higher education to people from economically and educationally deprived communities. If you think back to my statistic about the 260 
local authorities which have areas of deprivation within them. The FE sector is the sector which can reach them and pull them into a university environment. Next slide. But if we were to go down the route of a tertiary education system, the policy would be utterly frustrated if this new system was to be managed centrally. How could the center micromanage a merger of higher education and further education? Moreover, how could it bring educational policies to be more dove dovetailed with regional development? We need decentralization because we need bottom-up policies which are innovative and which are critical to coordinating with regional priorities. Decentralization, in our view, would free the system from suffocating centralized constraints, and it would stimulate local and regional solutions to questions of disadvantage and e equality of opportunity. And there are certain principles which I think it's worth considering uh, for integration and decentralization. One is that there needs to be clear decisions on the levels of devolution and of the division of funding responsibilities between regions and the center. A second is that there needs to be the provision of an appropriate governing authority structure at regional level so as to continue to safeguard institutional autonomy. But in putting forward these ideas, we do not mean that decentralization will abstract higher education from a significant measure of state involvement. What is important, we think, is that research policy, research management, and research funding should remain a central function. We think that there has to be a continued national quality assurance uh, process, and there has to be continuing national financial accountability. So where would this stand, next slide please, in the situation of central and regional government as it now stands? We seem to be on the verge of a constitutional revolution. And this is all to do with the creation of the combined authorities and the Metro mayors. We think it's absolutely critical that higher education and further education, in other words, tertiary education, should not allow itself to be excluded from these changes. We have Wales and Scotland as precedents. Since 1992, Wales has created a tertiary education system and Scotland is moving fast in the same direction. So there are precedents, what kind of structures could follow. There are reports that the government, that the treasury is involved in discussions with Greater Manchester and the West Midlands, two of the combined authorities in regard to the levels of budgetary devolution that might be considered. If that is the case, it would be perfectly possible to add uh, a quantum 
for higher and further education to the devolution. It's also clear that one at least of these combined authorities, and I think more, are themselves interested in the interrelationships between education and wider development. Manchester has already indicated an interest in post-16 education with a proposal for a Manchester baccalaureate programme, which is apparently been instantly opposed by the Department for, for Education. Next slide. So how would we go, no, one slide back. Thank you. <clears throat> so how would we go about this? Well, the important thing is that this would be a long-term policy to be followed, not a short-term policy fix. If we were to make the changes, we should proceed slowly, not all in one go. There is no case for a new Robbins or a new Deering Commission. What is needed is an extended policy discussion. What we would like to see would be the establishment of a government objective, a public government objective of bringing a regional focus into the management of the tertiary education system, which would set the framework for that policy discussion. Now, what are the chances of success? Well, there are very significant, new, new slide. There are very significant sources of resistance to changes of this kind. The first is, inertia within government, or perhaps that government has got other priorities for action and can't squeeze higher and further education in. A second element of resistance might well come from the Treasury or from the Department for Education, partly because it involves the transfer of a significant amount of funding out of Westminster. So it will not go unopposed from that quarter. There may well be resistance from universities who are concerned at the perceived loss of central contract with government. But of course, they would under the scenario that we painted, continue to have uh, very strong connections with government in regard to research. And one might ask, what benefit are they getting uh, from government uh, contacts at the moment from teaching? And finally, there might be a general concern about the dangers of parochialism and the loss of identity in national life if universities and FE were all grouped together under uh, combined authorities, combined regional authorities. Well, there one must turn to the evidence of Wales and Scotland. There is no suggestion that uh, Cardiff University or Edinburgh University or Glasgow University are any the less in terms of reputation, international standing, or attractiveness to students by being in a devolved area. And if you are associated with universities in Wales and Scotland, I'm not quite so sure about Northern Ireland, you are not aware at all of any decline in an interest in internationalism, uh, and so forth. What seems to us to be the case is that these universities gain from a close identification with region or place, and that this enhances their status as compared to be simply part of a national market and ranked accordingly. 
German universities flourish under a regional system, and there seems to be no reason why that would not be the case in England. Our conclusion, therefore, at the end of the research is that yes, there should be change. Centralization has run out of road. If there's a mood in government for decentralization, tertiary education should be part of it. We believe that would inspire new vigor and innovation, reversing the trends of the last hundred years. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, crystal clear. Um, I'm going to ask you one question and then we're going to go to Peter Lee and Peter Scott. Um, Mike, um, you rightly pointed to the role of Treasury in the UK governance system, its centrality to, uh, to government itself uh, and its capacity to um, direct or to veto policy changes in our sector. And there's a long history of this. The Treasury hasn't always been the origin point for new policies and I suspect at least some have passed through despite Treasury. Um, what do you think might modify Treasury opposition in this case? Are there any circumstances you can imagine under which Treasury would have an incentive to decentralise? Would there be financial incentives in shifting some of the responsibility downwards? Um, do you see any chance of Treasury becoming less oppositional and even supportive? Well, I, I think there is some hope there. Uh, I mean, it starts with the position of the economy as it stands at the moment. It's clear that what we've got is an absence of policies in regard to economic growth. And certainly it can be argued that economic growth uh, would be benefited if there was a much stronger regional involvement. That's part of the fundamental reasons okay. for having the Metro mayors. But the second, I think, reason is that what we've got now doesn't work. Mm. Um, <clears throat> It really doesn't work. And what you have and what you can see, and you can see in, in Manchester, for example, is that regions are going to do all sorts of interesting things, which the Treasury might think of as being rather uh, outlandish or risky. But actually, that's the way the economy ought to be run. The Treasury should be much more of a regulator and much less the supposed driving force for, for the economy. So I would take I would take a fairly positive view, but I think one would have to accept that Treasury officials have been brought up to think in a particular way, and it's going to take a very strong Chancellor of the Exchequer and a very strong communities minister to uh, move the goalposts. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Um, now we've got four people on the call list. Uh, I think um, I might bring people in in groups of two and I'll try and I think align them in terms of their the substance of their questions. So I'll go slightly out of order, folks, uh, and ask for Pete Leahy, followed by Alwa Bellini. Uh, Aneka, you might want to come into the conversation at this point. Um, Pete, can you come in first, please? Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Uh, and th thanks very much for the presentation. Very clear. I've actually read the book. It's a very good book. Everyone should read it. Uh, now, right at the end, you, you mentioned the strength of, of uh, the ministers required. Uh, up until that point, I felt uh, what I'm interested in, in is something that uh, you had left as very heavy subtext, which is uh, party political positioning 
with regard to, I guess, wider regional uh, strategy and the higher education component of that. Uh, I'm doing a, a research, uh, doing some commissioned research at the moment on regional higher education. I'm very interested in the theme. Uh, Spain's about to have an election and uh, uh, in Spain, they always change the, num the names of the ministries, uh, the arrangement of science and education with the changes in government from the, from the center left to the, to the right and back and forth. Um, and in England, uh, in the UK, one of the interesting things we saw with the uh, Blair government coming in after the long conservative governments uh, was the regional development agencies. And then more or less at the end of that, that was wound down and replaced with the local enterprise partnerships. And I'm wondering if uh, you have any assessment of those two programs and universities and further education's role in them and any uh, prognostications about the possible repositioning of a similar program if there is a, a change in government, uh, say, next year. Okay, so hold that thought, Mike. Uh, I think this question is more likely to be for you than Aniko. Um, let's bring in Alwa Bellini, please. Alwa. Hello, Alwa. Hi, hi, how are you? Hi. Far away. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's Alwa from South Africa uh, at the University of Johannesburg. I'm a postdoctoral fellow. I'm interested in higher education studies. Particularly, I'm working on a project on student epistemic access and success. So my, my interest really is around the issue of um, why the preoccupation in the, in, 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 the, in, the, in the UK and the other areas could be around issues of decentralization. I'm trying to then say, in the same context, do you think the African perspective could be actually around the, the heavy call around decolonization and transformation of African universities, particularly delinking from a colonial structure and system of the university in such a way that instead of having universities in Africa, we have universities of Africa so that even including issues of our economy is actually driven by the type of the education that our universities are actually giving instead of maybe a very Eurocentric type of education that at the end of the day does not really give us solutions. What is your view and take in that so that while it, there's a direction of decentralization in other parts of the world, Africa actually is getting involved in a serious decolonization and, and transformation of its own education system. I mean, higher education system. What would be your take around that? Thank you. Thanks, Alwa. I think the common element is, is embedding the university and other institutions in their context. You know, that's the common theme, if you like, uh, between the regional discussion in the UK and the decolonization discussion. Um, can I hand over to our presenters at this point? Well, let, let, let me let me uh, answer Pete. I'm particularly, of course, keen on answering Pete, Pete because he's read the book. Uh, that's such a pleasure. Um, but I have had experience of both the RDA system, the Regional Development uh, Agency system, and the LEP system. Um, <clears throat> the Regional Development agencies were set up by the Labour government. Uh, they were offices of the Department for Industry, but they were very sympathetic to universities. Um, certainly in the West Midlands, it really worked. And there was a university committee, universities committee, uh, which played a large part in, as it were, showing how higher education could help the economy. The LEPs, I think, formed by the 
Tories who abolished the RDAs. The Tories abolished the RDAs because they thought they were all being run by the Labour Party. Um, the LEPs were much smaller, much more restricted, um, and have been much less successful in regional development. So I would certainly expect a new government uh, to, um, to do away with the LEPs. And indeed, at the present, my understanding is that at this moment, the present government is not funding the LEPs for further development. In other words, they are thinking in terms of a shift to some sort of regional arrangement. Um, so I think that the mood is right, if only we can capitalize on it. Turning now to Africa, well, I think the, the country, the, the two countries that I suppose are most relevant uh, for this discussion are of course South Africa and Nigeria. Nigeria has always had a federal system. Um, and I think within the context of uh, economics, ups and downs and so forth, it's probably worked pretty well in quite a lot of Nigerian states. In South Africa, uh, it's a bit more different, but I think you do have a federal system uh, and you do have uh, a quantifiable regional government. The only universities I know in South Africa well is, is Cape Town. And uh, uh, that, I must say, behaves a little bit like Oxbridge. It seems to have a national a national role, but it didn't seem to me at all to have a regional role. But uh, uh, a regional role would seem to me to be important in, in South Africa. Um, <clears throat> that's a rather lame answer. But uh, <clears throat> what is clear is that if you're going to regionalize higher education, you've got to make sure that there's an infrastructure which can support it. Because quite large sums of money are involved and they can go astray very easily. They can be wasted uh, terribly. Um, and indeed, there is some discussion, controversy in the UK about two local authority or regional uh, misspends one in a small town like Woking, which is completely bankrupt. Um, and the other is in the Northeast, where a um, uh, Tory entrepreneur as the Metro mayor appears, I say appears, to have engaged in deals about property, which probably make quite a lot of sense in economic terms but don't seem to have followed all the treasury rules. So you do have to make sure that you have a really strong infrastructure before you regionalize. And that's probably a reason why in countries like Norway, countries like Ireland have not decentralized because they're sufficiently small for central government to be able to keep control or regain control if something goes wrong. Nico, do you want to add anything? No, that's that's. Let's see the other questions. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, we'll bring in Peter Scott and Ian McNay now. So, Peter. Uh, hello, Mike. Um, I too enjoyed your book. Um, I wanted to ask whether there are any lessons that could be learned from the people who, in a sense, supported the, what I would call the nationalization of the polytechnics in the 1970s. Because these are similar groups, perhaps, to people who might resist a kind of regionalization of higher education today. 
After all, we have been here before. I mean, Inner London ran five polytechnics, <coughs> all the bits and now the University of the Arts, um, 19 further education colleges, 12 adult education institutes. It was a system, as you know, similar in size to Wales, which is an interesting thought. Um, and the people who actually didn't like the politics beyond the local control um, were first of all civil servants, and civil servants in those days, I think, were rather more independent of their political masters than they are today. Um, secondly, of course, the polytechnic directors, the leading academics and managers within the polytechnics themselves, um, and only rather belatedly, the politicians came into it and in the kind of anti-labor um, bribe by Margaret Thatcher. Um, so if you look forward to people who might oppose it nowadays, I mean, I think there will be a lot of resistance from vice chancellors and universities UK and so on, unless there is a purely kind of cosmetic uh, regionalization kind of strategy committees in which people shared thoughts and really had no impact at all. Um, uh, secondly, Whitehall, um, and as I said earlier, I think um, civil servants are much more subordinate to the, the political line nowadays, so I think they have separate political lines. But if you take the particular example of the Treasury, which we've been talking about, um, I think any Treasury resistance is sort of structural, it's not just attitudinal. Um, essentially, what happens at the moment is the Treasury collects all the money and then divvies it out to people. So metro mayors, even Wales and Scotland through the Barnet formula, get money dispensed to them from the centre, um, with a very limited exception of Scotland, they have very limited uh, tax raising powers of their own. Um, mm -hmm. And I think in a way to make a regional policy work, you'd have to shift that around. You'd actually have to give, um, create a much larger and more substantial local tax base. So actually the money was coming through regions, not as a kind of favour from the central government. Um, and Finally, I think politicians, I mean, um, they also talk the talk about devolution and decentralization, but of course in these ways where everyone's performing so much as a politician uh, on the big and small screens, um, you know, Rishi has his five priorities, uh, Keir Starmer has his five missions, but also 10 pledges. But to be fair, one of those is about radical devolution of power, but I'd be rather skeptical about how they would come up. So I think the nature of politics being so performative and so kind of instantaneous nowadays, uh, politicians want to take credit a lot and actually they don't want to give power so that credit is actually taken by other people and they have to be more modest in their ambitions. It's just not how politics works nowadays. So I was just wondering how, how you might think those obstacles might be overcome, assuming no, you can't. agree with me. Mike, uh, I know that there's a lot to answer there, but I did promise Ian McNay that we bring him in as well. So, Ian, try to be brief. We're running out of time. I will uh, be brief. Peter has said much of what I would say. Um, I don't see this government being committed to decentralisation. Look at what they're doing with post-Brexit in trying to drag things back. Um, second, I'm not sure I see, as you do, any strengthening of the regional identity since the, since the Prescott referendum in the northeast, where the people rejected it. Um, so, have you any great evidence that there is a commitment within the regions themselves? Um, we used to have regional advisory councils, of course. You and I go back long enough to remember those, and they weren't very useful, so they went. And I think I've, I've been working, uh, in, in fact, in China, uh, in the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, and regional strategy there in higher education. And the similar things are, are coming. Um, and we have the research universities uh, cooperating uh, regionally in the Northwest, in the Midlands and whatever, sorry, in the North, Sheffield's there as well. Um, but they don't talk with the, the non-research universities. And there's that stratification, right? which you know works against the diversification and partnership so there are a whole lot of issues that I think it will be not and thank you yeah I, I i don't think it's going to happen i'm not sure the case has yet been strongly made i've got the book but i haven't yet read it so you you've got the you've got the money but you haven't got the interest yet <laughs> or not the informed interest thank you well those are two sets of questions, addresses that are quite hard to uh, respond to quickly. But let me, let me take Peter's first. I think that one of the weaknesses of the polytechnic system, or not the polytechnic system, but the system that the polytechnics were in, was that there was no real safeguarding 
body between the local authority and the institutions themselves. What I think would be very important if we were to proceed down the sort of path that I outlined is that uh, there should be a regional committee which would be uh, uh, which would defend institutions against a loss of autonomy and which would link closely with the combined authority of the Metro Mayor. And I think that was a, a, a great lack. Certainly, as I saw it in, 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 in Coventry. Um, taking Ian's uh, points, which I partly agree with, if you go to Scotland, what you don't find is the kind of snobbery that you might have seen at least a decade ago in England between the research intensive universities and the so-called teaching universities. Agreed. In other words, it is possible, it is possible uh, to envisage if you're an idealist like you are and like I am, uh, that institutions might begin to work together. And it was evident under the RDA system that universities did work together. Um, the evidence that we found from our cross section of universities uh, was extraordinary in the sense in which universities have changed. Universities in England have changed. Uh, universities which, uh, well, Plymouth is a good example, but you might go to some of the post post 92 universities, uh, Chester, for example, are doing all sorts of interesting things, which would be respected and would be things that uh, would attract partnerships with research intensive universities. So I'm not so bothered about the relationships between institutions, I've lost Mark. But I think that actually... Hmm. Apologies to all. We've got a bad connection back to Mike. Uh, I don't know what you can all see, but I see him as frozen. Yeah, um, there's some very strange sounds coming from him, which really aren't Mike at all. Um, I think because we're at closing time, um, I think I'll have to um, call it Mike. Uh, we lost you for a period there. Can you hear me now? No, um, folks, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll have to call it quits at the middle of the last answers to the last question. Um, I invite you to rejoin the CG webinar program next Tuesday, where our uh, presenter will be Fu Tao Huang, who will talk about transnational degree programs in China. Mike, I think you're moving now, so you're reconnected. Um, well, have we lost you again? Uh, I'm sorry, but we lost you in the middle of the last answer, and we can't hear you. I muted, Mike. Uh, Mike. Unmute your Mike. I think we'll have to close. It's just at the end of the webinar, really. Yes, um, of course. Yeah, it, we, we just lost your last half answer, I think. Um, but uh, th that unfortunately is it. Um, thanks for a really good webinar, nonetheless, despite your incomplete answer to Ian. Um, it was a magnificent explanation of the of the case for regionalization. And it will be on YouTube for all time. So people have got that as a point of reference and will use it. Um, folks, um, get hold of this book. It's one of the most important books on UK higher education for many years. The case for regionalization will gather steam. New government coming in. Regionalization is on the agenda, not yet installed in stone as part of the program, 
put on the agenda of a Labor government if it comes in. And higher education, further education will be a very active part. If the UK decentralises, it reverses 100 years of development and there could be major consequences for its role it, on the character of its higher education system in the years to come. And that is still a, an influential global model that matters elsewhere as well. Um, thanks, Aniko, for your work on, on the project. And I'm sorry we didn't hear more of your wisdom today, but I think Mike had it all covered pretty well. Um, and thanks for your participation, questioners. And, uh, and, and our other participants, we look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.